Hello, my name is Steve Brown, and I'm the worship leader at Vintage Faith Church. At Vintage Faith, we believe the Word of God is what changes and transforms a person. We hope you enjoy the next 30 to 40 minute sermon of the Word of God being proclaimed and explained. Enjoy the message. Hey, good morning. Yes, we are still in 1 Peter, and the scripture that we're starting with this morning comes from the book of Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, a chapter we should all be, we should all want to be familiar with as Christians. This is Isaiah chapter 53. I'm reading verse 3 to 9. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living? stricken for the transgression of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we ponder the Apostle Peter's words this morning is a church body that are directly coming from this passage in Isaiah. Help us to have gratitude and thanksgiving for the sacrifice of the Son of God. Lord, as Peter is going to instruct us on on what that means for us and how we live this Christian life. Help us individually and corporately to apply this great truth that we have been bought by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. We are not our own, that we are his, that he is the great shepherd of our souls. He is what every human soul longs for. Lord, make that truth just a little more clear to us this morning in our hearts and in our minds. And help us to to track with the the letter from 1 Peter and to put it all in context. And we pray and ask this in your mighty name. Amen. Well, good good morning. If if you have noticed, we're going to have a party afterwards and hopefully the rain holds off, so pray for that, but we'd, we'd love to have you. Um, even if you didn't bring anything, I'm sure there's going to be plenty of food, so please come hang out um, with us afterwards. We are doing communion today, and, and I, we did do it last week, so if you're thrown off by that, um, we're doing it because the text today is just, it's, it's right there. It's, it, it, it's the cross, and it's the blood, and it's the body, and it's, so we're going to be in Peter this morning. We're going to be contemplating this great truth, and and why not take the Lord's Supper together again? Um, All right, so as you know, we've been in in the book of 1 Peter, and and, and every week we're just talking about the the context, who Peter was writing to, why he was writing um, this letter, but uh, just to, to give you guys a, a little research I was doing this week, there, there's a site called ForTheMartyrs.com, and you may have heard of Voice of the Martyrs. It's a, a very similar site, and it's just about Christians all over the world that are being killed, jailed, persecuted for their faith, and they track statistics and all that good stuff. 
ForTheMartyrs.com have the top six reasons why Christians are persecuted. The number one reason all over the world today and when we look at, at 1 Peter, it's the same reason. The number one reason why Christians are persecuted, authoritarian governments view Christianity as a threat to power. So when you think about Christians being persecuted today in Korea, in China, all over the world, the government is saying, we have a, a power here, we have a king, but these people over here, they're giving their allegiance to another king, King Jesus. We don't understand this. This isn't good for the fabric of society. We have to do something to stop it. So this letter that we're reading from Peter to the Christians who were being persecuted 2,000 years ago, it has relevance today. In other parts of the country, it's more relevance than here in America, but we can at least see it right now. We can see, hey, this is very possible that Christians are not going to be welcomed in this, in this country. Right now, we have a lot of freedoms. We can gather here, praise God, and worship, and worship freely. Um, but in other countries, they, they cannot. All right, so Peter, last week he makes this kind of pivot in his letter, and he starts talking about how do we live? If we are citizens of the Lord Jesus Christ, if he is our king and we are citizens of heaven, how do we live as citizens in America, and in Rome, for Peter's audience, with Caesar is king. There's, a, there's, there's tension there, right? You've got King Caesar and, and, and King Jesus. So Peter's last week, this week, and next week, he's going to start unpacking how to live. How, very practically, how, how to live. But he's also not going to just be practical. He's going to base it all in theology. And that's why we're taking the Lord's Supper today, because he's going to, to base what we're called to do on Christ, on the cross. In the Roman Empire, around the time that Peter was writing, it's estimated that one-fourth of all the people in the empire were slaves, servants. The role of, of slave was significant <clears throat> to the social and to the economic fabric of, of the culture. Servants and, and slaves were common. They were common in, in households. Um, not quite like we think about slavery in America, in our history, um, the slavery that was Alive and well in the Roman Empire was probably not as harsh, but it could have been harsh at times. Um, but just know that. This is part of, of the context of the letter. All right, let's get into to 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 18 to 20. Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and to the gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing. When mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if, when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if, when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. All right, so we, to unpack this just a little, unjust, not only to the good, be subject to your master. So Peter's talking to slaves and servants, and he's saying, some of you have harsh masters. Be subject to them. That's a difficult one for us to wrap our, our minds and, and hearts around. Now think back to their, to their context for us, Say you're in a job and you've got a harsh boss, you can leave and you can go to another job. Things were a bit different back in this day and age. But he's calling these, these servants to, 
be respectful and subject to unjust masters. He goes on to say that this is a gracious thing. That word gracious is the Greek word charis, and it's a gift. It means favor from God. It means a gift from God. I don't want you to miss this. Peter is saying suffering under an unjust master. When you're doing good is a gift from God. I don't know about you, but I have a hard time wrapping my, my mind around that. He goes on to say, well, what credit is it if when you sin and you're beaten for it, you endure? So uh, he's going to do this. And multiple times in this letter, Peter is going to take out from under us, hey, I'm, I'm in this situation and I don't know how I got here when it's me that, that got me in this situation. Something I said that I shouldn't have said. Something I did that I shouldn't have did. He, he continually is going to remove that from us and say it's a gift if we're doing good and we are treated harshly for it. Peter must have in in view in, in some capacity his own story. When him and John were preaching the gospel and they were jailed, we looked at this last week, but we're going to look at it again, Acts 5. 40 to 41, and when they had called in the apostles, they beat them. So this is Peter and John, and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Then they left the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer for the name. Worthy to suffer for the name of Jesus. Rejoicing. This is, we almost don't have a context for for this in America, in in our comfortable suburbs and homes. We're not beaten for the name. And Peter was beaten for the name and he he left rejoicing. And we're going to look at why. why. Why would he rejoice? Why would he count himself worthy to suffer for the name? Right now, I don't think any of us are being beaten, but you may experience a a loss of a friendship. You might not be on the inner ring in your job because you're a Christian. You may be accused of being hateful, and you're not being hateful. hateful. You just believe, and, and you've got certain convictions, and people don't like that. Peter's going to address that in a few weeks. But have you ever considered yourself worthy when this stuff happens to you? When you're taking a stand for Jesus and something isn't going right because you are and you don't like it, have you ever thought, I can rejoice in this? There's actually going to be, Peter's going to show, there's solidarity with, with Christ, with our Savior. This is why. Let's go on, 1 Peter 2, 21. Again, this gets uncomfortable. This is not a text that, it's not a text that I would gravitate towards if we weren't in a book. Um, this This is a tough one. He goes on to say, for to this you have been called. To this, to suffering. That's what Peter's saying. To this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. So again, don't miss this. Paul does the same thing. Peter's saying the same thing. Paul says, you as a Christian, you are called to a certain type of suffering. Not not just suffering because we live in a fallen world. The whole world suffers death, disease, heartbreak, loss. Peter here is kind of cueing in to a certain type of suffering that the Christian is going to suffer. And 
if you think about it, we live in this world, and, and especially even in, in churches, in, in this kind of, well, even outside of churches, but in the spiritual kind of bubble that, that America is, whatever type of spirituality you are chasing. We live in a world that says God's favor and success, or success, equals God's favor. Big numbers, things running smoothly, means God's hand is on it. And we buy into this all the time in the church, all the time in the church. We see big crowds, we assume something has happened there. God has something going on there. Never mind the fact that some of the biggest churches in America aren't even preaching a gospel that's recognizable to, to the Bible. A few years ago, there was a, a, a pastor that I was reading, and um, a lot of us were reading him. He, he was kind of an up-and-coming um, star, and he, he talked about, I say star, and I, I, and I mean that in, in, a, in a weird kind of sense. He was an up-and-coming kind of rising star, and he had planted this church in, in Michigan, and I think it was the day one, 2,000 people. By the time this guy left, 10,000 people. And uh, he was a great communicator, but the guy has left the faith. He's, he never was preaching the gospel, and he certainly is not preaching the gospel now. And there's countless story after story after story of this. And we sometimes, we fall into this, and you could fall into it if you ever started a ministry or started something, and you're like, okay, I think God's calling me to do this. I feel like I'm gifted to do this. I feel like I want to do this. Um, I've got confirmation around me. Okay, I'm going to do it. And then all of a sudden, it's like right out of the gate. It's hard. And you're, you're experiencing pushback, and things aren't going like you thought. And you start thinking, man, maybe God's not in this. Maybe God isn't blessing this. And I would want you to flip, flip that right around and say, oh, maybe because you're experiencing that, he is. And he's allowing it. Or he's sending it to change you, to humble you, to teach you. Amy and I had... I think it was for 10 years straight, done a Bible study in our home. And it was week after week after week. And believe me, there were some weeks where people would come in ready to fight with me. Not physically, but just argue. And they, you know, opening up the scriptures and people wanting to argue that, and it was getting exhausting. And then some weeks there'd be one person show up. And you begin thinking, well, I'm not, maybe I'm not called to this. God's hand's not on it. If, it, if God's hand was on this, it would be huge crowds. Everyone would be coming to faith, and it would be a big kind of, let's sing, and kumbaya, and everything would be great. But I do believe that God's hand was in it. I do believe that God's hand was in it. And sometimes God is doing things in our suffering and our trials that, that we're not even thinking Karen Jobes says this, of, of this whole idea of suffering. She says that the idea of misfortune indicates divine displeasure was more prevalent in the ancient world than it is today. So, so this, this whole idea that we're talking about that we know is true in America was present in Peter's day too. Peter reminds his readers that Jesus' unjust suffering did not mean that God had abandoned him. To the contrary, unjust suffering was God's mysterious way to accomplish the redemption of humanity. So we're, we're going to, Peter's going here. This is where he's going. This is why he's telling, hey, slave servants, bear up under unjust suffering. Take it and, and rejoice because in that way, we're identifying with our Savior 
who is the ultimate case of unjust suffering, the just and the righteous suffering for the unrighteous. And human beings have struggled what, with what to do with suffering since the beginning of the world. We have one of the oldest written books in the Bible, the book of Job. What's the book of Job all about? Job is suffering. He's experiencing all this loss and, and, and all his friends come along and they're like, well, it's because you did this and you did this. You must be sinning. You must be this. Divine displeasure. We think if something's going wrong in our lives or our friends' lives or something is, is really not good, oh, maybe they, they did something to deserve that. And God rebukes Job's friends hard. And even Jesus, when Jesus was walking this earth, the disciples would look at, they look at a man born blind and they say, well, master who sinned? Why is this guy born blind? Did he sin or did his parents? And how does Jesus answer that? This man was born blind. You will see the glory of God. There is something in our suffering as Christians when we suffer rightly with God in mind that glorifies God. Karen Jobes goes on to, to say about this idea for one cannot step into the footsteps of Jesus and head off in any other direction than the direction Jesus took. And his footsteps lead to the cross, through the grave, and onward to glory. Through the cross, to the grave, then glory. Jesus tells us, you want to find your life? Lose it. Pick up your cross and follow me. And that's written in to the fabric of the world. Whether you're a believer or not, it's just a truth. It's just true. Every once in a while, as human beings, we can read or watch or, or hear a story that really resonates with us and affects us and changes us. I read an article in, in 2013 that really haven't been able to stop thinking about in a good way, in a, in a really good way, um, and I've, I've quoted from it over the years, um, but I, I just, I think a little of it is relevant today, and uh, you, some of you know the story because I've, I've sent you the actual article. Um, but it was 2013 in Japan, there was a huge snowstorm, um, whiteout, I, I don't know if you know this, there's areas in Japan that get just as much snow as, as here. And uh, a dad and his nine-year-old daughter So they were trapped. And it, you know, think whiteout. Like, there's a few times a year, may, maybe one or two times a year, that we've seen whiteouts here in, in Syracuse, where you're driving and it's like you can't, you can't go, you can't see the road, you can't see anything. So you got a father and a daughter. And they're trapped. And they get out of the truck because they were trapped and try to walk towards safety and can't. So the father <clears throat> wraps his arms around his daughter. And I want to read a quote. So this is an article uh, by Owen Strand, who kind of, sorry, is interpreting this story through a Christian lens. So th this is a story that, that happened in 2013, and Owen is a, he's a theologian, and, and he's, he's kind of looking at what the Father did is, is something that is echoing what Christ did, what the Father did for us. And he says this, 
Sometimes in life, there's a moment that crystallizes the deepest realities of the world that brings, as the novelist Wendell Berry has said, a revelation. Sometimes ordinary people have an unwitting chance, a flash in time, to play a role in such a revelation. On that winter day in March, when Mikio put his arms around his daughter, his life became something greater. Visceral and unreal, awful and beautiful all at once. So Mikio shielded his daughter from the elements that sought her death. He did so until the next day when authorities found him still hunched over his little girl, still shielding her, and he ended up dying. And this is a type of suffering. This is an unjust suffering, but this is a type of suffering. This is a type of giving of our life that's written into the fabric of the world. And this is why Peter is saying, for to this you have been called. And some people might look at this story and just say, well, there's nothing good in that. And I would submit to you that Mikio's life is not wasted in any way, but this story reflects one of the deepest realities the world needs to know, and that's the sacrificial love of a father, and in particular, the sacrificial love of our Father in heaven, who gave his son so we could live life For life. Peter says, For to this you have been called. Whether we're choosing the suffering like like that by giving our life, or whether we're bearing up under unjust suffering as a Christian, we have been called to give our lives, and suffering is part of it. All right, so Peter goes on. There's another way that we follow Christ in suffering. All right, 1 Peter 2, 22 to 23. He committed no sin. So here's where Peter's getting, okay, he's getting practical. Servants, bear up under your unjust master, submit. Next week, he's going to talk about wives and husbands. Last week, he talked about the government, but he's not going to just leave us there. He's going to go right to Christ. We're going to do this because Jesus did. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. Jesus had full trust in the justice of his Father. Even ironically, though, this act is not an act of justice as we know it. Jesus suffered the wrath of God that we deserved, but he had full trust in the justice of his Father, and we should too. Paul says in Romans, if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. By doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not become, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So can we honestly talk for a minute about justice? This is a, a, a doctrine in, in Christianity a lot of people don't like. I'm sure there's people in this room that don't like it. It's an aspect of God when we read the Bible that we want, kind of want to move past quickly. If you're talking to someone who doesn't believe, you're most likely not starting with the justice of God. But I would just, to get you thinking, 
if you're one of those people who do not like the idea of God being a just God and a wrathful God, look at the world around us right now, especially if you have anything to do with Twitter, Facebook, and any other new social media site that I probably don't know where people are yelling at each other. There is a mob mentality of justice right now outside, this is the secular world, outside of the church, that if anyone messes up, whether it was this year, last year, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, they want blood and they need the wrong to be righted. There is an innate human desire that every human being has for justice. I would even go so far as to say we live in a world right now that is obsessed with justice. And what Peter is getting at, and what Paul is getting at in Romans, vengeance, it's not ours. God is the avenger. God will execute justice. It's his. And if God is not your avenger, you want justice so bad, there's only one option. You will be your own. If you can't trust God when you are wronged, I'm not talking about someone that you have a relationship with and you need to work it out. That's a different story. I'm talking where, where you're wronged terribly and there's nothing you can do about it. Like this servant who's living with a harsh master, there's... He's not going to argue his way out of this. There's only one thing he can do. He can bear up under it and trust that vengeance is God's. Because again, if we don't trust that vengeance is God's, it'll be ours. And we'll have to do something to get it. When we suffer unjustly, we identify with our Savior and Lord. But Jesus did not just leave us an example to follow. One of the... one of the very popular ways of thinking right now within the church is Jesus was an example and we're going to follow Christ but he didn't die for our sins because that's really an old concept. That's a, that's a brutal, unfair, cosmic child abuse. It needs to, to, to be done away with. We gotta stop thinking about that. Jesus was an example, the cross was an example. Now we just saw the cross is an example and we are called in a sense to follow um, in that way, giving of ourselves, turning the other cheek, bearing up, under injustice. One of the the great leaders in the progressive Christian movement um, said this, and hopefully you can spot the error in this. As human consciousness advances, there's an error right there, more and more people cannot believe that God would demand Jesus' blood as payment for our sins. It seems to be inevitable that our old logic needs to break up before we can begin to grow up. So I would just say, be careful. If you're reading books from people you don't know, you're going to find this type of theology in it. It's becoming pretty big. And in these churches, they look cool. They're growing. There's a lot of excitement around them, but they are denying the heart and soul of the Bible, which is, 1 Peter 2.24, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. Amen. Amen. He bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we die to sin and live to righteousness. 
We've been healed. Have you been healed? Do you know Jesus in this way? As a substitute for your sin, as a savior. When you mess up and, and, and sin, even now, do you take it to Christ? Can you look to the cross and say, okay, I did that. I, 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 I shouldn't have. I, I sinned. My heart wasn't in the right place, but thank God because Jesus died for me. And he carried that sin that I am, am just wrestling over and unhappy that I did. He carried that sin on the cross. He bore it in his body. Paul says he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we can become the righteousness of God. This is the heart and soul of Christianity. Anybody that tells you anything different is off. And I'm saying that to just warn you. And, and if you're hearing things that are just not talking about that or denying that. It's off. That's it. That, that, that's the central message of the Bible. He became a curse for you so we can be blessed. But he became a curse. In the book of Deuteronomy, Moses says this, and I believe this is where Peter is pulling from when he says tree instead of cross. You're wondering, why does Peter say tree? This is why. And if a man has committed a crime punishable by death, and he is put to death, and you hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain all night on the tree, but you shall bury him the same day. For a hanged man is cursed by God. You shall not defile your land that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance. Jesus did not commit a crime punishable by death, but according to God's law, all of us have. And he bore the punishment on the tree. He was the cursed man on the tree, so we can be blessed. The entire message of the Bible is building up to this point. If you remember from our Genesis series, we had that the, the promised seed, remember, they're looking like, okay, we, we were in paradise and now we're not. And, and God promises the offspring of the woman. And they're just looking for this offspring. And they're looking, like, when is he coming? When is he coming? We want to get back to where we were. And then Abraham has his son Isaac, the promised seed, the one who they're thinking maybe he's the Messiah. And God tells Abraham, go bring him up on the mountain and kill him. Oh, why? why? Why would he tell him that? He's the promised seed. Why would God tell Abraham to kill the promised seed? The seed of the woman. And God steps in and says, don't do it. Don't do it. I'll provide the sacrifice. And this is all building up. This is the sacrificial system in the Old Testament. Leviticus. This is the Passover and the Passover lamb and the blood of the lamb. The entire Bible is pointing towards we need a substitute to die in our place. And that substitute must be perfect. And only God is perfect. For us to live rightly before God, innocent blood must be shed. That innocent blood is the blood of Christ. It's not the blood of goats, it's not the blood of bulls, it's not the blood of lambs. All that was a dress rehearsal prepping for thousands of years, prepping the people of God for our benefit to see that this is all about Jesus. When John sees Jesus, what does he say? Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Everyone, every human being wants Eden again. They want paradise. They want to get back in. And they're trying to kick the door down, but there's only one door. And Jesus Christ says, I am the door. No one else. There's one way back to Eden, 
to paradise. It's through Jesus. If you entered through the door of Jesus Christ, Have you said enough of trying to do this on my own and be my own Lord and be my own master? I can't do it. I've made a mess of it time and time again. Let's put him on the throne. Have you done that? Give yourself to him. He is good. He is gentle. He is lowly. He says my yoke is easy. My burden is light. And when you do, all the suffering that's common to humans and all the suffering that you're going to experience for, for, for knowing Christ, it's going to be infused with meaning like you've never known it. All of it is going to have purpose. Nothing will be wasted. None of your suffering. There's no other religion, there's no other philosophy under the heavens that can claim that and that can give you that. The Apostle Paul in Romans, he gives us a little perspective here. He says, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time aren't worth comparing with the glory that's going to be revealed to us. This life is but a breath. It's a breath. It's going to be over before we know it. Quickly. For some of us, a lot quicker than others. And Paul here is saying, these sufferings, they won't compare to what you're going to experience on the other end. What are you going through now? I know everyone in here is going through something different, painful. Just know it's not worth comparing to, to the glory that you're going to have. All right, so Peter, he continues his, his thought here. For you were straying like sheep. Again, he's taken this right from Isaiah that, that Evan read. He, he's, he's in and out of Isaiah 53 with, with all of this today. For you were straying like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Have you guys ever thought about this analogy, which the Lord uses, and, and it's all throughout the Bible, that we are sheep? It's not a flattering analogy. It's actually meant to be a bit jarring, to, to take our pride and pomp and to say, oh yeah, we're just kind of all dumb sheep, right? And we, the first thing that we see, we kind of wander to it. We see something shiny over here, over there, we, we wander. We're sheep. We wander into the latest and new ideas about God. We wander into numbing ourselves with food, alcohol, lust. We wander into anxious thoughts that we don't need to be thinking. We wander into the lie that God is against us. We wander into thinking that life is all about us and our comfort. We wander into seeing everyone's happy life on social media and hating our own because we want theirs. We wander into greed, being selfish with our money and thinking it's ours and not from God. We wander into gossip, harboring resentment and bitterness. We, like sheep, are prone to go astray. The song from the famous hymn, Prone to Wander, Lord, I Feel It. Prone to leave the God I love. And that's us, that's all of us. That's you, that's me. We have to know that about ourselves. We're sheep and we wander. We're on this hill and we look over at the other hill and we're like, man, that looks nice. Why am I here? I want to be there. And then we go there. And we look at another hill and we say, that hill looks nice. And we see something moving around over there and we chase it. And meanwhile, the whole time, God is like, I am your shepherd. Just follow me. 
follow me, don't worry about all this other stuff. In the book of Ezekiel, the prophet was preaching during the Babylonian exile, and he had some, some pretty stiff and harsh words for God's people. In particular, he had stiff and, and harsh words for the prophets, the priests, and the kings, all the people in authority. And the Lord speaks into this because they were exploiting the people and they were using the people for their money and for gain and, 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 and just not shepherding the people, God's people well. And through Ezekiel, God says this, For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I, I myself will search for my sheep and will seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock when he is among his sheep that have been scattered, so will I seek out my sheep, and I will rescue them from all the places where they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. He goes on to say, I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep, and I myself will make them lie down, declares the Lord God. I will seek the lost, and I will bring back the strayed, and I will bind up the injured, and I will strengthen the weak and the fat, and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them in justice. So here's the Lord speaking in, saying there's coming a day when I myself will be the shepherd of my people. And what does Jesus do when he's walking this earth? In John 10, he identifies as this. He says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd does what? Lays down his life. For the sheep. So when Peter says, You were straying like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls, and he's connecting this to how did he do it? How did the good shepherd gather his sheep? On the cross, through his death, through taking your sin and bearing it him, himself so you could have his righteousness. So again, I would ask you. If you don't know Christ, he is the shepherd, the great shepherd, the great shepherd of your soul. He is everything you, you need, but you don't know that you need. If you're wondering what it is that we do here, it's all about Jesus it's always all about Jesus. This isn't Jesus plus other things. This is Jesus and just every other religion and philosophy. They don't work together. It's only Christ. It's all about Jesus. And if you do know Jesus, know that you're prone to wander. The sheep nip and bite at the shepherd, and we all do that at times, right? We think about God, and, and we're in a cranky mood, and we just don't want to hear what his word says or what his word says through someone that's talking to us. We're prone to drift. We're prone to chase what we want to chase. We want what we want now. The grass looks greener, but we need to listen to the shepherd's voice. So we are going to take communion again. And as we, as we take communion as a body of believers today, I just I want to ponder what Peter is talking about, that we have died to sin and risen to life through Christ. And I want to together have gratitude that he is the great shepherd of our souls. And it's come at a great cost to be redeemed. Communion is just as much a family act, you could say a corporate act as it is individual. When we take communion together, we are in a sense as a body of called out 
people, God's people, we're declaring the gospel together. We are declaring that we believe in the story of the Bible, the death and resurrection of Jesus, and at the same time that we declare we believe that, we're actually denying that we believe all these other narratives that are being fed out in the world. We're participating in Christ's body and blood together. In fact, the Apostle Paul says this, the cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a particip- participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there's one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the bread. So what Paul is saying and what they did in his day, they had a loaf of bread, and that loaf would symbolize that we are all one body. And as we eat today, we need to remember that we are all one body. There's nothing magic in this bread. There's nothing magic in this juice. But through faith, God is present in the Lord's Supper. This is something he commanded his people to do. It's part of the worship service. Let's just take a minute. And just repent of any wrong thinking we have about God or or others. I just want to give us a minute to, to clear our minds and our hearts. Prophet Isaiah said, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. So there, there it is. Oh, divine displeasure must be. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds were healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Christ's body was broken for us. Let's eat together. Isaiah goes on to say he was oppressed. He was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent so he opened not his mouth yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him he has put him to grief when his soul makes an offering for guilt he shall see his offspring he shall prolong his days Christ's blood was poured out for us let's drink Heavenly Father, as we sing this last song, help us to worship together as a a family and rejoice that you took our sins on the cross, on the tree, that you were a curse so we are not cursed. Lord, as we fellowship and eat and hang out together. We just pray that your spirit is among us, that you unite us in mind and thought. Lord, we love you and we thank you and we praise you. In your son's name, amen. Thank you for listening to the Vintage Faith Podcast. At Vintage Faith, our vision is to help people who are far from God to become totally devoted followers of Jesus. We pray that this podcast brought you closer to God. For more information, check us out at vintagefaithcicero.com.